So, um, good morning, everyone. Um, Fernanda, great presentation. It's going to be a tough act for me to follow. Um, but what I'll talk about here is why uh, machine learning is, um, is obviously very exciting, but it's also gritty and challenging. So I'm really going to take machine learning and data from, uh, from, from the realm of art, uh, Fernanda, as you talked about, all the way to the factory floor. Okay, so we're going to talk about, you know, why, um, you know, some, someone said that machine learning is um, the sexiest job of the 21st century, right? Uh, we've all heard of that, and that's why I think many of us have kind of gotten into this domain, and it is exciting, uh, but I'll also explain why it's a lot of hard work, especially when you put it into the real world, and really talk about some of the real world examples and lessons learned in terms of, uh, putting machine learning models uh, where they matter, which is putting them to work, to be able to take good decisions on the behalf of uh, customers, good decisions on behalf of businesses. So that's really what I'm gonna be covering. Um, quick intro, um, I'm, you know, I work at Wells Fargo, really passionate about using data uh, as a means of uh, transforming decisions, um, you know, whether it is uh, through machines or whether it's through human beings, being informed by the best possible data, that's something I, uh, you know, believe truly in my core, so that's really been, you know, part of my career uh, for the last 15, 20 odd years. Uh, I've been told that my, that the favorite words that I use is cool, okay, a lot of people I'm guess I'm guessing use, the, use that word, but the other word is why not, okay, so I enjoy and love going and challenging the status quo, uh, and it's exciting uh, to challenge people's assumptions and see what, you know, what they think about in terms of work. Uh, and how they should be thinking about their work. So, so I love doing that. Um, contact information, if any of you want to get in touch to understand a little bit more about you know, what we're doing, more than, happy to, more than happy to share. So let's start with how you know, machine learning typically goes. Um, you know, most stories will start like this, right? You have this machine learning package that you know, many of you must be working with. It's you know, in your favorite open source language, it's got a long list of, you know, attractive, juicy algorithms that you can use for your work. Um, it's got lots of ways in which you can put in code, it produces all of these beautiful graphs and all of that. And for me, the next thing is what is typically the most disappointing, it ends like this. It ends with that <laughs> titanic data set, okay? I hate the titanic data set, you know? I'm like, you know, uh, first of all, you know, doing lots of machine learning, on a data set where like a lot of people died seems very um, you know morbid to me. Um, for people who are not familiar, it's basically the list of all the people who are there in the Titanic and information about you know whether they were first class, second class, third class type passengers, their gender, their age, etc., and whether they survived or not. Okay, um, so that obviously kind of um, does not appeal to me as a human being that we use that data set so frequently. Uh, the other reason is, you know, it's got 2,000 rows, okay? 2,000 rows is a small Excel file, okay? And in the real world, uh, our data sets are orders of magnitude bigger than, uh, you know, what you, what you deal with here. And so the overall kind of feeling is not, you know, great. You know, you're like, okay, you showed me something with a small data set. Uh, how does it really translate to the types of problems you need to be solving in the real world? And that's really what is going to be my lecture about, which is, hey, you know, how do you take machine learning models and how do you deploy them into production? And what are some of the lessons learned? Uh, what are some of the people skills that are important in the space? And how do you how do you actually make that uh, uh, make that translation? So um, something is not clicking. Things seem to have frozen. <laughs> this happens all the time when we do machine learning, <laughs> by the way. I just got an email today morning that some cluster crashed, something, you know, you've got to go and fix stuff. So, yeah. It's Windows. Yep. Well, nothing works, you restart the cluster. That's what you do. <laughs> Story of my life, you know. Of 
because I think the good thing here is that Windows machines have started booting up way quicker than what they used to. I remember the time when it used to take like 10 minutes um, for them to boot up. Almost there. Okay. Uh, All right. We're back. The cluster is up. Awesome. That one? Right. Okay. So, you know, it's, it's really uh, no surprise that what you have is that, you know, machine learning is right up there in the Gartner hype cycle, right? So Gartner produces this graph of, uh, you know, the hype cycle, what they, what they talk about is, you know, the innovation trigger all the way to kind of where you get productive, and this is the point where things are hyped up the most, and deep learning and machine learning is right there, you know? And the reason is exactly that. There's a lot of really cool, interesting research work that happens, but when you try and apply it in real life, you know, we either don't go all, go all the way to make the translation, or we find that to be extremely challenging. And so, what we really are talking about here is how do you get extract value from machine learning? Uh, there's tons of customer value, there's tons of business value to, to think about, uh, but there's no easy button. Okay, so there's, it's not easy, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, I was chatting with people um, before we got in here, chatting with a lot of the students, and we were talking about this exact same thing. You know, the algorithm kind of sits in the middle there, but you know, there's a the data you've got to worry about. You know, where does that algorithm go? Where do you deploy the model? All of this is challenging stuff. So that's, that's really what um, we're going to be covering. And I'm really going to talk about three things. Um, what does success in machine learning depend on? It depends on getting a lot of alignment within your organizations. Uh, you need to integrate your model with the overall tech ecosystem. And you need really smart and uh, competent uh, data scientists and technologists uh, to achieve success. Um, so these are the three things that you know, we've learned uh, with, you know, with you know, the work we've been doing at Wells. And I personally have learned with my work in other organizations that it's really uh, getting these three things right. Uh, and by the way, you know, when you're making presentations, remember it's always three things. So, you know, so if there's nothing else that you get out of this talk, make sure that you structure your ideas around three things, okay? Um, all right, so um, alignment. Alignment is critical, okay? Um, I've been part of organizations where there's a lot of lip service played to machine learning. It's been said to be important, but the right resources don't align. Okay, and it's frustrating, okay. Um, it's very difficult to get anything done when the different functions within the organization don't come together. Uh, what you want to see is really, you know, like the perfect, you know, bird formation where all of the different pieces start to align with each other. And what are those pieces? Um, you obviously need good data scientists, but you need technology. Um, you need strong data management. Uh, you need operations, customer service, where these solutions are going to be employ, uh, deployed. Uh, you need finance and funding, right? Because without the right funding model, none of this will really take off the ground. It's all of these forces that need to come together, and that's really brought about by strong leadership uh, and uh, a business will to kind of operate at the top. Um, this is a big change, okay? Uh, when you're trying and doing this in organizations, it's a massive undertaking, it impacts multiple parts of the organization, and you need that alignment, right, to come in. Uh, if you're working in places where that alignment isn't there, um, sorry to say this, you might be just wasting your time, okay, because till you get to that different forces agreeing that this is really a top priority for them, and getting to work together, you'll not make that progress. Okay, so alignment is really important. Second, uh, let's talk about uh, integration with the larger ecosystem. These models, are only effective when they really go out and do something, right? So let me kind of take a bit of a diversion. Um, Tiger Woods, I guess the question is, what is he doing in a data science presentation? Um, so there is this saying in golf, you know, I've heard it, you know, when I tried playing golf, which is drive for sure, putt for door. Okay, so, uh, you know, taking that big driver and kind of clubbing the ball looks, you know, very, appealing and stuff like that, but that's really not where you make strokes. You make strokes when you, um, 
by doing the kind of simple stuff by playing around the green. So Tiger Woods, um, you know, when he came into the scene mid '90s, uh, you know, obviously big big achievements. But one of the big things that he did was transform the way the game was played. Okay, he brought that power and athleticism to the game. And so if you see men's golf today with you know, what it was 25 years back, you can see the players looking very different. You know, back then it was like uh, you know, older men you know, with, you know, with over, you know, oversized sweaters and not looking in good physical shape. But now the players look very different. And a lot of that transformation is because of this man. You know, he kind of changed the paradigm of the sport. And therefore one would think that you know, where Tiger Woods made a difference in his game was really about that power that he could generate from the green. Um, and the reality is, yes, that was the case, kind of, right? But where he was really better than the rest of the professionals was on the green, okay? So there is this measure that the PGA uses, which is strokes gained per round, which is basically how much better you are as compared to the average PGA Tour professional. Uh, and Tiger Woods was number eight uh, off the tee, okay, when he was using the driver, but he was number one on the green, okay. So it was really about, you know, going back to those same principles. It's not, it's, you know, the drive, it's, it's, not, it's not a bad thing to be number eight off the tee. That's awesome, you know. Uh, but being number one on the green is where, you know, you really count where you're able to make the difference. And so putting this to machine learning, I'll say, Train for show, score for dough. Okay, uh, you can train the most amazing uh, machine learning model, but where it really matters is when you actually deploy it into an operational set. So, um, models built in a lab, great for experimentation, but the real value is only when you deploy it. You know, in the bank and in the hospitals and in the call centers and. Uh, you know, in retail establishments, that's really where the value comes, okay? And translating from this world to that world, really challenging. So let me, let me talk about why this is challenging, giving a little brief history of how information systems have evolved in a lot of legacy organizations and potentially even in a lot of the newer organizations. Um, you have these things called applications. Okay, applications are basically kind of software packages that do something, right? So they show you your balance, they take your phone call, they uh, do a bill pay, you know, when you're talking about financial services. And then you've got these data flows that operate between applications. It's basically the data that needs to go from one application to another for it to do the thing it's supposed to do. You know, pretty simple. Um, the problem with these data flows is that they are very contextual. Okay, they are point in time information required for the next application to do its thing. Okay, so you don't have deep history of you know, multiple years of information and stuff. So how did people get around it? They would take this data and put this into things called analytic data marts, where you could compile years and years of history together. And uh, that's great because to be able to do any kind of analysis, any kind of trend spotting, you need uh, that long history of data. Um, that is what you use then for training your models because you, you oftentimes require several years worth of data to build really good models. But then, these models need to go back into those operational data flows, okay? That is really where the difference happens. That's where the decisions get made. And so the model that you're building on this analytic data mart needs to then uh, find a way into an operational system. Um, it's challenging because you're talking about different technologies. Uh, especially in financial services and banking, uh, these applications have existed for many, many years. And there is a lot of risk to actually breaking open these applications and introducing something new. Okay, so there are lots of reasons why you would not want to touch something that's already working well. Okay, but at the same time, if you have to make a difference from a machine learning standpoint, you need to be able to break open those applications and embed the solution at the right place. So, um, what do you need? So, so what we've been thinking about at Wells is really kind of three different ways in which these models get deployed. Um, you have models that are stored in batch. Okay, they run every night or every week um, and largely rely on historical data. Targeting models used in marketing is a great example of where you rely on tons of historical data to be able to deploy those models. Uh, you have models deployed as a service, okay, where uh, you have an application making a REST API call uh, to the data and being able to return the prediction based on that. 
typically use it with uh, where you're relying on both real-time data and historical data. A great example of that is in the fraud space, okay, where you need to understand the behaviors of the customer as well as try and get a sense of um, you know, the historical, the, the real-time kind of transaction that triggered uh, this call. And then you've got um, embedded models, AI at the edge, okay, where you know, you've got you know, Google Home, you've got uh, Amazon Echo, which are basically reacting to real-time data, and they have some embedded intelligence to do that. So these are the three different kind of patterns that we are working towards uh, and uh, have started building out some of this work already at the bank. And this is a good framework as you start thinking about machine learning models and how did they get deployed. You know, are they batch models? Are they, um, is it something that needs to sit real time or is it a model as a service where you need that combination of uh, real time as well as uh, historical data? Um, finally, last but not the least, um, talking about this room, right? You need really smart data scientists and competent IT professionals to get this done. Um, so what are we talking about here? So you've probably seen this Venn diagram somewhere, okay, where data science is a combination of a few different disciplines. Uh, you have domain knowledge, you've got math and stats knowledge, and you've got software engineering skills. Uh, all of these really need to come together um, for, uh, for us to find a strong data scientist. Um, oftentimes it's not realistic to have one individual having all of these skills, and so you often tend to uh, center your data science work around teams. Okay, so you've got people who are really strong in math and stats, who've got okay software engineering skills, partnering with somebody who understands software really well, and you know the third leg of the stool being, of course, understanding the business space. Again, I think there was a question that you know uh, we had at breakfast, which was uh, how important is that domain knowledge, right? And how much do you need to have that within the team? And um, how much of it is, you know, you rely on SMEs? And the answer is you do rely on SMEs a whole lot. Okay, people who've been running the business have built a really strong intuition about how a, a certain domain works. And, you know, we'd be, uh, we'd be overlooking that uh, very obvious kind of area of knowledge if we did not tap, in that, tap into that knowledge. However, what also happens is that if you're a good data scientist, by the time your work is done, you will be as good, if not better, in that domain knowledge as that other person. So the, the thing that, you know, many of you who aspire to be data scientists, the thing that you'll be um, uh, expected to do is, every time you're working on a new domain, you've got to understand the domain, you know, almost kind of start to finish. Some people find that exciting, some people find it taxing, okay, but that's a reality. You know, I think that's, that's something that you'll be expected to do. Uh, but this is not everything. Um, I think these are things that are important uh, for anyone to qualify to be a data scientist. I personally look for a few additional things on top of this. Uh, and what I look for is, you know, are you a skeptic, right? How much are you willing to be, you know, your toughest, your own kind of toughest critic, right? Uh, do you have curiosity? Do you have that cussedness, which is that, you know, I'm going to get it right, you know, that dog with a bone kind of an attitude, saying, I'm not going to get, let go of this problem till I really understand what's going on. And oftentimes it's kind of also smelling the BS, right? When uh, you're able to understand that something, that some, something that's being told to you is not realistic or is not accurate, and you're willing to go out and challenge that, right? So these are, I think, some of the softer skills that I think are equally important as all the things that I talked about in the previous slide, okay, which is, you know, in addition to the technical skills, you need to have that attitude of skepticism, of, um, you know, curiosity, of, of just, you know, willing to kind of stick with the problem and seeing it through to the end. Uh, that's, that's important. Um, lots of examples of how this thing has kind of tripped me up. Okay, these are like personal uh, mea culpas in terms of things that I've done and realized later on that there's been a problem. There was a problem, there was a model with an extremely good R squared. Uh, whenever you see a model with great R squared, please, you know, there's probably something going wrong, you know. <laughs> uh, you've used some structural component in the model uh, where you're basically cheating, okay, and trying to predict something with information that you already know, so it's like predicting childbirth and using pregnancy as an indicator, okay? It's, it's kind of linked structurally, you know? So you cannot be using that kind of stuff. 
Uh, models with great performance, never been cross-validated, you decide to put that in production, no, you know, you'll, you'll run into the risk of uh, overfitting. Um, models trained on random events, quote unquote random events that are not, not quite random. You build your best models when you use randomized data. If somebody tells you that some data is randomized, you better go back and check and make sure that the right experiments were run to generate that data. Oftentimes, data that is assumed to be random tends to have some structural relationship within, which makes it non-random. Okay, so you've got to be really clear whether this was, these observations were truly independent or were, was there some bias? And there's invariably some bias. Okay, so watch out for that. Um, a model where the validation numbers didn't line up. We built the model, we deployed it in production, we ran the same data through the models, and the models were off. You know, they, were, they, they weren't off by much. They were off by uh, the third and fourth decimal place. Okay, so if you looked at the average around uh, the different observations that we used, uh, the third and fourth decimal places were off, okay? Turned out to be a huge deal, okay? Because those numbers were meant to be identical. And the fact that they weren't identical meant that something was messed up in the data, okay? Um, finally, model inputs may be related to the previous point that look different during training and scoring. On this current model that, you know, we're working on in the fraud space, there's an approved decline indicator um, that we're using in the model. Uh, as, a, as a training variable, uh, we got an approved decline field um, at the time of scoring. Guess what? Turned out to be the, a different field. Okay, you know, somebody looked at it and said, yeah, you know, there's an approved decline. It must be the same thing. Turned out it wasn't. Okay. So one of the biggest things that I think a, a successful data scientist needs to have is that ability to kind of make sure that every single dot is uh, every single I is dotted and T is crossed. So you've got to get to that level of detail and have that attention to detail for you to be successful. And that's really what uh, you know, we try and hire for. Um, you just cannot be a math whiz. You've got to be a strong process engineer. Um, when you build models, you're using historical data, near real-time data, real-time data. Uh, when you're training your model, it all, it all looks good. When you're trying and scoring your model, it doesn't work because the near real-time data and the real-time data needs to now suddenly come from a different source. And when you're getting data from different sources, the data will not match, okay? You gotta put the effort to make it match. So these are just some lessons learned in terms of uh, some of the things that you do. Um, so data science, therefore, is not the only thing, right? What do we do as data scientists? We understand business needs. We build a math equation. We try and solve it. Uh, no, you know, the job doesn't end there. Uh, you got to think about data engineering as well, okay, which is, uh, you know, what are the data formats? How do you run at optimal performance, especially at runtime? How do you need to persist the data? How do you monitor these models that you deploy in production? Equally important skill, okay? So, uh, again, you know, as we look to build our teams, we are not only looking for great data scientists, we are also looking for great data engineers. And, of course, then the common domain is like, you know, mapping that data between model training and scoring where these teams have to collaborate very closely. So, you know, people skills, I think, ultimately are the ones that make a ton of difference. Um, you know, all of us as data and information uh, students and professionals like to think data make decisions or information makes decisions. The answer is no. It's actually people who make decisions, okay? And you've got to get the right people involved in this work to make sure that the right decisions get made. Okay, so getting that people skill right, I think, is super critical here. Finally, you know, this is a graphic that I love, uh, which is, okay, you know, given all, this, all the things that I said, how do you actually go and do a data science project? My advice would be start small, but figure out how you do things end to end, okay? Um, Understand the business problem well. Define the solution space. Take the simplest example of that solution and implement it end-to-end -end and put that into production. That in and of itself is such a big step that any improvements that you make on top of that, adding new data sources, changing the algorithm, changing the model, all of that becomes easy. Okay, once you've taken that first model and put it into production, that first step is usually the biggest step. Okay. Um, I've seen data scientists do different things. They, you know, they'll 
go for the best algorithm. They'll go and try and get the most expansive data. Uh -uh. You know, just make sure you take the simplest thing, put it into production, and then you've got the machine set up, and you can start making improvements to the machine, right? So, so yeah, those are just some lessons learned. Again, uh, you know, hopefully it was a very different perspective about what are some of the th real life things that matter from a data science standpoint. So uh, I might have two or three more minutes, so why don't I take some questions? Yeah. Chris, thank you very much. Really appreciate that. Yep, yeah, we've got a few minutes for, uh, for some questions. So I've got uh, a number of hands up here. I saw a couple at the back there. So gentlemen, just in the back row first. Uh, OK, and then we'll go to you. Hello. Yep. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for a good presentation. Um, from the organizational perspective, uh, how do you place the data scientists within the organization? I mean, you talked about what qualities the data scientists should have and what they need to do. From organizational perspective, do they belong in IT or they, they do they belong with function or you have a separate group altogether within Wells Fargo? Yeah. So. Um, it's a great question. It's something that we talk about and grapple with all the time. Um, in my opinion, a data science is a function which is very close to a business function. Okay, it's really about solving customer problems and business problems, and so the person doing the problem solving has to sit very close to the business. Okay, I don't think it's a technology function. I think it's a function that involves a lot of technology, but it's ultimately a business function that you do. Um, within the business, I think there are questions around do they sit federated, distributed within the business, or do they sit centrally? Uh, at least what we're seeing is that it's important to first get a critical mass, okay, and get the momentum going. Getting that momentum going is easier when you have uh, a little bit more of a central group. But over time, as the organization starts to get value out of this, it can very quick, quickly evolve into a hub and spoke kind of a model where you have still that central group providing the direction, providing the momentum, setting the standards, but then you've got distributed data scientists within the businesses actually doing the work. So, so that's really the journey that we've been through. Um, again, you know, I think it's really important that you're close to that business problem that you're trying to solve. Not to say that there aren't problems that you want to solve within IT. So IT can probably have its own data scientists, but they're solving IT specific problems, trying to understand, say, network weaknesses, you know, cybersecurity, infosec, all of these have got great data science applications, and that's where you could have data scientists sitting within IT. Great. Question with the row just in front, and then we'll take one more there. Uh, thank you for your presentation. So, um, so I have a question around you know the end-to-end -end, end implementation. So typically, um, you know, when I'm involved in an effort where there's engineering and then there's there's data science, there's kind of the philosophy say, okay, let's go end-to-end, -end, let's lay the steel thread. Right, let's get the system working, um, and then we'll improve the model. Uh, the challenge becomes then, you know, as a leader who then s goes to an executive and says, okay, we're gonna build this in Q2, we built it, you know, for Q3 now, how do you go back and articulate the case for improving the model where you may not succeed? Like, you don't know what the magnitude of the impact is going to be. Um, and you know, as as kind of a manager, I end up defaulting towards building new functionality where I can like quantify what the deliverable is versus improving the accuracy of a model where like I, I just am not sure because you really truly have to go back yeah um, and rebuild. So I'm curious for your perspective on how to kind yeah. of do that. See, see I think um, part of that is I you know at least from my perspective, I think it's expectation setting that every data science. Uh, experiment is not going to be successful. Okay, there are many, many times when you try something and you don't, you find that, hey, you know, this didn't add the value that we thought it would add, or this data source didn't add anything incremental because it was so closely correlated to something that you already had. Um, the the way at least we've been we we've, we've tried to approach this is by saying, okay, this is the canvas. These are all the things that we can do. Let's vision that end space that we want to work towards. But then let's start to carve out the ones that we want to do in phase one, phase two, phase three. So you're always kind of uh, setting the expectation that this is not the end. This is the first amongst many steps to take. 
but it's important to take this first step and build that thing, whole thing end to end, uh, so that you can then, you have that foundation on which you can improve the machine on top of it. I'm not sure whether I completely answered your question, but you know, happy to chat offline if that helps. Yeah, I think from my Actually, can I, can, let's, let's take it offline because I do need to move on, okay? Thank you, one question there. Thank you, final one for this section. A lot. So uh, there are uh, financial services has regulatory requirements that means that you've got to um, explain uh, your your decisions to the customer. That is a requirement. Uh, but you know, back to the biases standpoint that Fernando was making, uh, it's I think it's it's a moral imperative for all of us to make sure that the models that we build are you know not subject to any kind of biases. Okay. And so, you know, even for internal kind of uh, peace of mind, okay, I think it's important to make sure that your models are interpretable. Uh, and so, you know, I personally get nervous if it's a black box model. I prefer to spend the time and, you know, invest the time to make sure it's interpretable. In some cases, it is required by law. In some other cases, you know, you're doing it just make, to make sure that you have a robust solution. So, okay. Please join me in thanking Krish. Thanks so much.